when you hear the term blockchain, the, the easiest way to think about it is it's a set of computers that maintains a decentralized ledger, which is just a statement of account, uh, which uses strong cryptography to verify the ledger, which is constantly changing state. So whenever I say ledger, think about a bank that maintains a list of accounts and how many dollars you have in each account. The bank is responsible for updating the bank accounts anytime transaction comes through. In this case, replace the bank with a large network of computer systems that do not rely on a centralized entity. Um, the, whole, the whole thing here is to assume that nobody alone is a trusted actor. So the only things that are uh, put into the, the blockchain and committed are things that everybody agrees on. So um, there's a couple different ways that's done traditionally. When it was first started, it was done by what's called proof of work. So computers are solving mathematical problems. When they, when enough of them agree on what the right answer is, uh, then they commit that block. Newer blockchains use something called proof of stake, which uses actual money or cryptocurrency to uh, secure the, the system. So if, if there is a bad actor, um, they they've got a lot of money potentially at stake, which can be taken away if they don't behave correctly. So that's the basic idea of how the blockchain aims to maintain a golden set of information, which can't be changed. And we can see every single state of that from the beginning of time to now. And I'll describe a little bit about where the value is in that. Um, so when you hear people talk about cryptocurrency, that's just an implementation of the blockchain technology, which roughly resembles a currency or something that stores value. The, uh, the biggest ones that you hear about and that we'll, we'll be talking about are Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP. The Bitcoin was the original implementation. Uh, there was a, a kind of a pseudonym person that named Satoshi that put out a white paper describing it right at the same time that they actually turned the network to go live and it's been on since then. Ethereum came along a couple of years after that. And instead of focusing on payments, it's actually focusing on what's called a smart contract, which is essentially code that you commit to the blockchain. And there's an execution layer on the computer system that will actually execute that code. And so all of these systems are validating the codes being executed correctly. They're maintaining what the code should be along with maintaining a ledger of accounts holding anything from ether to custom tokens we uh we we focus more on ethereum than anything else a lot of it is because it is the most flexible blockchain uh with the most potential applications and a, a lot of what we see value in long term is in the growth of the whole ecosystem and then finally uh we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh xrp uh which is another it's, it's another payment system but it's focused specifically on removing friction from cross-border payments. So think countries paying each other or people paying each other across country boundaries. Those are areas where the traditional banking system, you're, you're running across different systems with different implementations that don't necessarily speak the same language. It can take multiple days for payments to settle. That's what XRP is trying to uh, eliminate. So they're trying to get it where if you need to pay somebody, it doesn't matter where they are. It can, it can happen very quickly. So if you hear blockchain and cryptocurrency, that's the gist of what we're saying. Now, why does it matter? Um, so the, a, a lot of the kind of traditional finance sector is like, well, what's, if this is a currency, what's backing it? Um, and there's, there's not generally a, a, a known answer by the general public, but the, the, the very basic thing that back it is it's basically an immutable or non-changeable ledger which you can look at every state from the beginning of time that you're not relying on any one entity to maintain correctness. So typically either a government or a bank or some, some sort of company is trusted by everybody who utilizes them. So you're trusting, let's say, Chase Bank to maintain your account ledger correctly. And if there's a problem, you go to Chase and you're trusting that they will fix it. So in this case, there is no single entity that's trusted. Everybody is considered non-trusted, but when a large enough consensus of the group agrees, then that's considered the trusted state. So comparing that to modern fiat currencies like the US dollar, the euro, all that stuff, they no longer have any hard backing. 
they aren't backed by, they used to be backed by gold for a long time, but that changed several decades ago when you could no longer take dollars to the US government and then they would hand you gold back. The only thing behind them is the government's promise. Uh, and they don't promise really much of anything other than the fact that they will pay debts in that currency. So if you loan the government money, they are promising they will pay you back some amount of USD. What they're not guaranteeing is what will that USD be worth in the future? What can it buy? Um, so we talked about banks as well. Uh, if a bank is maintaining this ledger, we don't know what practices the bank uses to maintain the, the correct ledger or how often they take a, a history snapshot. So if something does go wrong, you go back to the bank and it's, it's, you're just assuming they've kept enough records that they can go in and figure out what happened and how to fix it. One of the fantastic things about especially the public blockchains is because you can see every single state change from the beginning of the blockchain to the end, you can go exactly through and see exactly what things changed hands when. It's there, anybody can look at it. So it's very transparent. Um, these big centralized actors like banks and governments, communication between them is very, very difficult. They're all implemented on typically old computer systems that don't talk well to each other. And so any sort of financial settlement across boundaries takes, uh, it's measured in days. So like when you buy a stock, let's say you're, you're trading on Thinkorswim, when you buy a stock, that doesn't actually settle for two days after you execute the trade. So there's a window there where you can't really be certain whether the trade actually happened or not. Until it's completely settled, you never know. Additionally, if we're talking about non-monetary things, uh, anything we consider a, a, a rarity, an artifact, memorabilia, a collectible, often those come with a certificate of authenticity provided by somebody who we were calling the expert, who is verifying where it came from and that it's real. There's, there's, it's too easy to counterfeit things. And so the strategies used to verify them are generally based on heuristics rather than an actual chain of custody. So when we're talking about collectibles on a blockchain, we know we can trace back that collectible, that exact, we'll call it a token, all the way back to the beginning of time when the creator of that token created it, we can see every single step in the process and we can also verify that that is the exact token. It's not something that somebody yesterday came up with and created a replica of. So blockchain uh, provides all of these ways to solve trust issues by basing everything in the decentralized ledger. Um, that's the fundamental technology and why there's value. So when somebody asks, what's backing something, that is the answer. That, that technology, that ability to maintain a golden state without having to trust any one entity is the, is the value. So I know, uh, I think the, the thing that most people see when they uh, either hear cryptocurrency or not is they see the price, right? The price goes up and down, it's subject to, to FOMO waves. It, there's speculation and all of that stuff. So what, we are, what we're looking at is crypto as a technology. And this, this graph compares the internet users from the early days of the internet. The graph starts around 1990 and goes all the way to 2009. It's showing on the bottom axis from about 2016 what crypto adoption looked like along the same log scale. So it's, it's increasing at a very similar pace that the internet was in its early days. So right now that puts us around 1996 or 1997 in the internet days. So if you can think back to what the internet is now versus what the internet was uh, in 1997, that's, that's how early we are to this. So when you're talking about uh, volatility, investing in this space, if you buy into the value proposition, we're still waiting for that inflection point where it's easy enough for everybody. There's enough products for everybody. It's fleshed out enough that the, the broader world starts using it. And I expect this graph to continue just like when the internet came out, a large portion of the population was dismissing it as, oh, well, it's just computers to talk together. What are we going to do with that, right? How is that going to change our life? And I think if you ask anybody the same question today, uh, the answer is pretty obvious. Um, this particular graph is from a uh, 
a presentation that uh, A16Z, which is a kind of an incubator and uh, VC fund put out actually just recently, it might've been yesterday. Uh, and you can kind of, they, they have a report called the state of crypto, which goes through some of this and kind of shows you some of these trends as to what's underneath uh, below just looking at the price. Here's another graph from that same presentation where we have price up at the top. So we can see how volatile the price is. You can see the peaks and the valleys and all that. Now, if you look underneath it to see what's happening underneath that you can't see on a computer screen. So you can see social media activity has continued to grow extremely quickly. Development activity and startups and funding have continued to grow at ridiculous rates, even with, even with the price recently cratering in the last year or so, right? We're still continuing up that curve of the market is figuring out how this thing will change our lives and moving forward. So that is still progressing, even if the price is very, very depressed. 